It's called the MMT. It used to, that used to stand for the Multiple Mirror Telescope, but they changed the mirror, and it's no longer a series of mirrors. It's one, but they didn't change the name of it. I think they were hoping someone would give them a lot of money and they'd name it after them. And this is the Large Binocular Telescope. You didn't go there, did you? No. Okay. Which is now the most powerful telescope in the world. And, and I had been to a couple others that weren't as powerful as this, where they talked about how they were much more powerful than the Hubble Telescope. And the Hubble Telescope is much more expensive. And nobody could really understand why we were spending all that money to send one up into space when we could do better and cheaper down here, but I guess that's where the glamour is. Isn't there an atmospheric built thing now? Yeah, but things like the LIDAR can take that all into account. They, I mean, they showed me some side-by-side -side pictures and I was convinced. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd love to just ask a question that maybe we can discuss as we as we go through some of the images, because I want to make sure that we have time to, mm -hmm. I still have to look at some of the infrastructure stuff, yeah, sure. if, if we have time. Um, but this maybe kind of goes back to the question that was asked earlier about these, treating these as kind of aesthetic objects. But I guess I'm curious, because you, know, you mentioned that Nikki and I had taken this trip around the Southwest, and I, and I feel that, um, that at least speaking for speaking for myself, you know, the, the sort of poetic attraction of gigantic, almost sublime pieces of equipment doing engaged in invisible processes and uncovering things about the universe that, that couldn't otherwise be detected. Um, it has such a mythic and, and um, and uh, yeah, literally kind of sublime feel to it. I guess I'm just curious about that, the notion that these have very different, and I don't know everyone in the room, so I mean, some people might be looking at this and thinking, wow, the specs on that physics experiment are great, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring this back to my lab. Right. And others might just be in sheer awe of the kind of aesthetic appeal of the, of the devices. And I guess I'm just yeah, kind of curious about that idea that physics uh, experiments like this are enough to make my wife and I take a car out into the desert for a week and visit these things, and it's enough to get you to fly all the way to Antarctica. Yeah, exactly. And so what is it about the kind of like physics as pilgrimage site? You know, you go a kilometer into a mine, and then you get it, and then you harness yourself with the ropes and go another 200 feet. It's weird. So what is it, what is it about, the, 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 what's the, you know, where, where does that appeal come from, and, 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 and in, in your opinion? Are you saying I'm weird? <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. <laughs> Um, well, part of it is about that, that, I hate to use the word journey, the, the trekking, you know, the traveling to get to some place. And, and sometimes it's just a place that no one else is, no one else is there. Or, you know, I've been to some telescope sites where I've seen some amazing birds, and that's almost enough for me. It's, it's that going someplace that I haven't been to see something that most people haven't seen and to be able to bring back something to show them that might get them interested in it too. So, I mean, I have to be able to make a good picture, so I go to the sites that are more interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that answers the question. I wonder for both of you though, or do you like in your trip around the Southwest, I guess, and, and you said, Jesus, is it because of what's going on there physics wise, or is it because of the built structures that are part of that? It's, it's both. I mean, I, I think one of the other things that I didn't say before that one of the reasons that I did the project was that I find that we're, we're in such an anti science and anti intellectual country, especially now that I wanted to do something to bring this science a little bit more into the, the public discussion. So yes, they're, I think they're totally cool places, and, and why don't you? you know, take a look at this and, and see what, what's coming out of it. Um, there's, a, there's a book that, uh, that, it, that just came out, actually it's by Margaret Wertheim, who's a Los Angeles-based uh, science writer. Um, but it's, uh, it's basically about outsider physics, um, so the, it's, it's a profile. She noticed in about the late 1980s that she was getting, um, people knew she was a science writer, so she'd get everyone, everyone who had a crackpot theory and had you know, filled a sketchbook with their own theory of the atom or with their own drawings of you know, toroid-shaped particles that are passing through the universe, et cetera, um, would send their dossiers to, to Margaret as a, as a science writer, like hoping for validation. 
And so she started realizing that um, she wasn't throwing them away, and so suddenly she has this archive, this library of, of, of crackpot physics theories. Hmm. Um, and it was interesting because then, even though I, I'll be honest and say I feel like the book comes to kind of all the wrong conclusions about why these theories should be taken seriously on a cultural level. Right. Um, it's just interesting that she's asking about, you know, what is it about the specifically theoretical physics that is kind of this new uh, sphere of poetic and theological wonder for people where, you know, William Blake and his era is going to go out back and he's going to fantasize angels and demons and he's going to strip naked with his wife and write poetry, etc. But now you're more likely to go outside and think, well, well maybe not you at one, uh, it's, it's, it's just as likely to fire up the typewriter and start thinking about you know, whether or not uh, it's, we live in a world of points or a world of, of topology, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so theoretical physics then becomes the kind of the, the, the realm of poetic uh, speculation. And some of it, though, is actually ironically precisely because of the remote nature of some of the things that you're showing right. here, that in order to be a physicist now, <clears throat> you have to have a multi-billion dollar budget, you have to have a hollow mountain in Japan, you know, you have to have huge amounts of work crews behind you to put these things together, and it, it's no longer just, you know, Einstein and his notebook thinking in a, in a quietly in a room. So it's interesting in the sense that the very success of physics is the very thing that makes people, um, especially in the United States now, which is very, which I agree, at least on a popular level, is very anti-science. The, the success of science makes it invisible to everyday people, and so people seem to think that science no longer does anything for them. Right. And it's the remote, the, I mean, so in some ways, I guess, you know, it's not even that, you know, we, we need photographs of physics experiments, we need to somehow find another way to get physics experiments into the city. And, and it's almost like the bubble, right. the disused um, bubble chamber that you showed in the very first slide, you know, yeah. bringing those to Park Avenue and parking them there might even be a kind of exciting way to inspire seven-year-olds into the future of physics. It could. I mean, there, there is, I mean, there's a great history of citizen science, and actually the astronomers have, have there's one astronomer I heard a lecture by that set up something called the Center for Backyard Science, and everyone can take part in this survey of the universe and really contribute something to science. Um, there, are, there are birders who are, are doing all kinds of things that they might not be trained ornithologists, but they're contributing to the field. So there are a bunch of fields where there's a history of it, and I think physics maybe not as much because you need these big experiments. On the other hand, if you're a theoretical physicist, all you need is a notebook. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's why you're getting those, because it's, it's easy enough. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't need the big money. Mm -hmm. I don't know. My dad is a laser physicist for NRL in DC. Uh -huh. and, uh, he started out as a much researcher, like a lot of military guys, I think he's doing more managerial. But when I was like, you know, from six, I guess like five to age 14 or so, they opened it up one day a year to to families, you know, mm -hmm. to non, uh, you know, other than that. that you right, yeah, like they that. need to open things up a little more. Yeah, but it was awesome. I mean, he had like a lab with a Faraday cage in the corner where his desk was, right. and like a laser going around. You could stick your finger in and of course get out. And wow. So I wondered, like, I mean, it was it was fun. I didn't really give a shit yeah. about the physics behind it and the major grenades. <laughs> but did you see it? Definitely, this is more esoteric. You can't like stick your finger in the neutrino beam. But did you see anybody have that kind of fun with it? Well, no, I mean, one of the things that's different about so many experiments now, and the, especially the telescopes, is that you don't get to look through a telescope and see things, and you don't get to look at a physics experiment and say, Eureka, you're looking at reams and reams of data, or your computer is looking at the data, and, and sometimes lots, you know, thousands of people are looking at the data, so it becomes a lot more removed. Um, I mean, there are places like the Exploratorium in San Francisco where you can go and look at experiments and learn the basic principles, and I think that's a great thing. Um, but, but to actually do something here, you know, you can watch the mirror move, but there's not that much else you can do. Um, yeah. There's an experiment run. Is that the facility time shared for different experiments? Or, or yeah, I mean, for, for a long time, that was a big issue in big science. Like people would lie and cheat and steal to get more time on an experiment because it was so hard to get and, and because it was so valuable. Um, I think because of the, the nature of it's changed in that everything is a big collaboration now. Um, the time is much more defined. On the telescopes, uh, I mean, you kind of sign up in advance. And uh, places like Mauna Kea, all of the telescopes have to give some time to the University of Hawaii because it's their site. 
So their astronomers get to do a bunch of things, and whoever is part of the collaboration gets to do it. And then if you're an outsider, you might get to do get to have some time. So it's very uh, very proscribed about who gets to do what, but you know, it's there are a lot of different players. How many primary experiments are running at CERN right now? Thousands or hundreds or a few or um, around the Large Hadron Collider, there are four big experiments and three smaller ones, and I think that's about 10,000 physicists. Wow. So, it's, I mean, the, there's been a huge drain of physicists from the United States to so Switzerland. On-site or in there? Well, they don't have to be on-site, but a lot of them are. Yeah. Yeah. Or they go to the part of the universe. Is there a data center attached to it or something like that? It has an enormous room of uh, serially attached computers and they built a whole new, uh, it's like a whole separate internet thing, it's called the grid, that's shared by a bunch of universities around the world and I think Google and a few other places because the amount of data that comes out of, out of the Large Hadron Collider, Collider each day I think would fill several thousand DVDs. It's an enormous amount of data to analyze. They'll, they'll be analyzing it for, for decades after they're done with the last experiment. So it's like drones, right? They're always behind? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. This is the, uh, the McMath Pierce Solar Telescope at Kitt Peak, up on top. Our photos. It's a great modern building, too. And inside there. It's lots of big hypotenuse. Right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, this is actually a really cute little one, um, the Caltech Submillimeter Telescope at Mauna Kea. I mean, cute. this was this was all about aesthetics. How cute it was! <laughs> oh, it's like twenty feet high. Tiny compared to everything else there. And this is the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope which is inside the building. Okay. I'm sorry, that was the last one. Okay. Do you want to transfer over to the infrastructure sure. ones? So we're just going to maybe go through them while, and yeah. while, while basically opening up the, the okay. interview Q&A. Okay. So. Um, I guess actually while, while you're queuing that up, it's, um, it's over to the right. If you oh, did you leave it on your desktop? Yeah. 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 Hit, hit cancel and then. You were talking to me. Nah. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you may have seen these before. From the days when you could get access to these places. Do you want me to just go through them quickly? With yeah, the let's just do a quick, a quick run through because okay. I feel like yeah, they're too good to miss and okay. then uh, we can talk about infrastructure. This is uh, the anchorage of the Verrazano Bridge. And the Manhattan Bridge. the former champagne cellar in the Brooklyn Bridge. The City Hall Station, which you can see, you can stay on the six train. Apparently they don't kick you off anymore. It's just south of the Brooklyn Bridge Station. It's too small to accommodate a whole train so it doesn't stop there. But this was one of the original stations. We're up in the watershed here. This is the Never Sink Reservoir, the, the outflow of it. And the Croton Falls Reservoir. I'll take you down, we'll start out a couple hundred miles away and come back to the city. They, they used to control the flow between a couple of the smaller reservoirs in the Croton system with this little gatehouse. Uh, 
uh, to the Cannonsville. That's the that was the last reservoir that the city built upstate. This is the, the new Croton Dam, which you can go see also in Westchester. Inside the dam, where there are many pigeons. <laughs> they kind of insisted that there was no inside of the dam, and then I showed them the plans. <laughs> so they had to let me in. Also inside. <clears throat> That's part of the new, relatively new gatehouse at the Croton Reservoir. Uh, this is the first tunnel that the city built, the old Croton, at Ossining, where it crosses over a bridge. And the Hillview Bypass Tunnel, which they were working on when I, when I went there, or it probably would have been filled. And the, this is up in the Bronx. This is the empty Jerome Park Reservoir, which they, they empty every couple of years to clean. The Central Park Gatehouse. Didn't find any diamonds there. Uh, this is an old gatehouse, uh, sorry, not gatehouse, a shaft that was in Chinatown that's no longer there. They took it away. You could get into this capsule and go down a few hundred feet to the tunnel before it went to Brooklyn and shut off the water to Brooklyn. But they never used it. Is that for Croton or? This is for tunnel number two. And this is the valve chamber for the new tunnel, part of which is in operation already, but uh, won't be completed until 2020. That's in Van Cortlandt Park. All well, same place. Not a subway tunnel. Another, it's a smaller shaft uh, valve chamber under Roosevelt Island. Why is the new one square? That? Yeah. What? Um, it's not really, it's not a tunnel as much as a, a way to, if you need to take one of those apart, yeah. there's a crane that'll drop it down to a, a rail car on that track. Yeah. And the track, at the end has a shaft that goes up so a crane can pull it out. So that's purely for maintenance, no water goes in there. You should say, why is it wet then? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's infiltration coming through the concrete from, from the ground. And that's part of the new tunnel under construction after the tunnel boring machine has gone through and, and the tracks are in for the workers. That's somewhere underneath Brooklyn or Queens, about a thousand feet down. And one of the, when they pour the concrete outside of this, um, the whole thing vibrates a bit to get the bubbles out. And then once the concrete's set, this whole form folds in on itself and they drag it to pour the next section. About how long is the form? Like how much this form? one, um, maybe uh, 100 yards. Is that attached to the tunnel board machine or the? No, no, the tunnel boring machine is, is, is way ahead because a lot of work needs to be done between the tunnel boring and the concrete boring. How long does it take for the concrete to set? Um, I think they give it a few days or a week. So 
Um, I have a few pictures here of the old Brooklyn water system, which I've actually started to do a new project on. This is the Ridgewood Reservoir, right on the Brooklyn Queens border. Um, no one really has done much about the history of it or to preserve it or um, anything. So I'm trying to get a couple institutions interested in doing an exhibition about it. So it, the water came from wells and and small lakes along the Sunrise Highway out to the Suffolk County border. And this was the end of it, and there was a water tower right near the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm sorry, uh, Brooklyn Museum. This is one of the old gatehouses. This is in Wantaw. And this is the last picture. That's another gatehouse right in Massapequa. OK, that's all. Cool. Um, well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to go back to the idea of removing infrastructure from public inspection or even public awareness. And uh, you know, when that happens, the city then becomes this mechanism that seems that it should always work. Um, it doesn't require any uh, uptake. Why pay? You know, there's no point in paying taxes because there's no infrastructure that needs to be fixed. It's all no one gets to see it. Right. Um, and I guess I'm curious about then two questions about how do you re. Um, invigorate public curiosity about the city and public awareness about how the city functions as a mechanism and as a piece of infrastructure. But then two, what are the political consequences of disallowing awareness of the very things that are the kind of infrastructural super products or super projects of, right. of um, citizens today? Well, let's start with the second question first. Okay. Um, I think if you, if you kind of take it out of the public sphere, then People wonder why you're spending money on it, and then. But if you if you do it uh, boldly enough, like Giuliani tried to sell the water to privatize the water system, then people get up in arms and they say, "No, you can't take it away." So so you kind of have to uh, remind people what it's there for and that it's theirs and it's not to be given away. So I mean, I think you need to be more open about it. I think the biggest threat to a lot of inf infrastructure is that it's deteriorating and that it's not being taken care of. Not that somebody is going to poison the water system or drop a bomb somewhere. Yeah. So, um, and the other question was... Basically, I mean, it's, yeah, it's even part of your project in photographing these spaces to kind of uh, revivify the human or the, the kind of uh, citizen imagination when it comes to urban infrastructure so that people are as excited about this as they would be about Coney Island or, right. you know. Yeah, I mean, when, when the old Croton Reservoir was built, well, the old Croton system was built, there was this enormous public celebration and I just found out there was a similar celebration in Brooklyn when the Brooklyn system was built. So one was 1842 and the other was, I think, 1857. And people would would make day outings, and they'd take a boat or, or a carriage up and go look at the the old Croton Aqueduct, the bridge, at the uh, high bridge. So I don't know. I mean, I think we've spent so much time trying to keep people away from stuff. They're they're almost suspicious when you invite them in. Although um, Open House New York has had enormous success in opening up places that are not normally accessible to the public. Unfortunately, so much of the infrastructure is still off limits. They haven't even been able to get get sites open, but I know they're, they're working on that. But I think that's, you, know, you need to do more, more public projects, more public programs about, about these places so that people don't forget where their water comes from or where it goes or where their garbage goes or where their electricity comes from. Um, I mean, I was photographing, I was walking by 14th Street the other day, and I hadn't realized that the whole Con Edison plant was kind of closed off. You used to be able to drive or walk down 14th Street, and you can't go through there anymore. So you know, there's another place that was public that's now private. There's just too much of that. Um, well, it's, it's funny, speaking of Con Ed, um, you know, you mentioned, um the, or I think you mentioned the Exploratorium. Um, San yeah. Francisco, um, that, uh, I, was just, I was just in San Francisco about two days ago and someone was saying that uh, just several years ago there was a, basically a permanently uh, on display tornado in, in, in the Exploratorium as yeah. a way of showing how air currents uh, form and form tornadoes and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but something I thought was, it was amazing was that um, just recently 
Um, I took a bunch of students up to visit the Con Ed um, steam plant on 74th Street, which is basically the, sort of the cousin of the one on 14th Street. It's, yeah. sli it's a slightly right. smaller one. Um, but what's incredible is that the way that they actually generate steam is by, they basically have, uh, they have these injection guns that spin uh, basically what amounts to a tornado of fire inside this giant furnace that is, that is boiling pipes that are on the outside of the chamber. Oh, and, and when you look inside, it, it, yeah, it burns, it's like a brilliant red yeah. room full of these vertical pipes with wow. a tornado of fire burning inside. Yeah of it all the time, but I feel like if people knew that there's basically a permanent tornado of fire burning on 74th Street, um, the sort of the magic of infrastructure right. would become more apparent to, to everyone, but as it is, you know, you have to petition for weeks over email just to get a tour of this place, yeah. and then you have to, right. you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, everyone is just so completely paranoid, and I don't get it. I'm doing this project now um, where I'm walking all of Manhattan, and what got me started was that I was interested in the spaces where buildings have been torn down, and all of a sudden you have a view of the whole front of, I don't know, the Chrysler building, or just the backs of a bunch of buildings that you couldn't see before. So I thought, well, how do I find all these places? And I concluded that I had to do something that I've always wanted to do, which is walk to every block in Manhattan. And so I'm finding all these incredible things. I mean, things that I knew to look for, like little evidence of infrastructure where it pokes out of the ground. but but also, I'm encountering all these places that are more restricted than they used to be. And some of them are like tunnel entrances where, I don't know, thousands of people drive through every day. Probably, you know, any one of them could have a camera in there. And I'm standing there taking a picture of them, and a police officer is trying to wave to me that no pictures. So for once, I'm working with a small camera so I can take a picture quickly and just act like I never heard him. But also, I mean, I would take a picture of the front, the front entrance of J.P. Morgan, and the security guard would come over and try to stop me. And, and I know that if I'm at a public sidewalk or a public street, and I'm not trespassing anywhere, he can't stop me. And usually when you explain that to them, they back down, but they'll try to stop the next person because they won't know the law. So there's this, there's a lot of, um, ignorance about what we are still allowed to do. Um, I mean, I think probably four or five times people have tried to stop me where they had no right to, to do it. And I mean, let's not even get into the issue of should the police stop you from taking a picture of a tunnel? That, I think that's ridiculous. So you have lots of pictures of buildings with the guy in front of it like this? I have a few of those, yeah. yeah. I had a question about infrastructure. Um, back topics back, but um, how does the information about these different uh, works and the infrastructure that surrounds them get passed from sort of generation to generation or work work generation, work set to work set? Um, you mean how do the people who work on them yeah, continue? Yeah. So well, they're, they're there all the time. I mean, right. one of the things that it's that's striking is despite the lack of money and the lack of knowledge by the public, there are these incredibly committed public servants who are working, you know, doing whatever they have to do to make the water pollution plant continue to work or make the water continue to flow. So they're, they're on the job. I have no, no worries about them as long as they don't all get fired. <laughs> so, um, I mean, one thing is, one thing that I worked on was the, uh, the water department had an archives on 38th Street that had pretty much been neglected for 50 years. And there's a ton of incredible, useful information and great old drawings. And we managed to convince them to let us resurrect the whole place and order it. And there were um, you know, thousands of photographs that we cataloged so, and drawings. So now it's a working archives. But I'm sure that there are a few others of those that, that we haven't discovered yet. I mean, I had a chance to work at uh, Washington or WMATA, it's one of the mass transit authority in Washington. Uh -huh. And there's a big audio room there where um, all the intercom systems for all the trains and all the dispatchers and all, the time, all come out of this room. Right. And there was one guy who knew how that room operated. Wow. Only one guy. Yeah, that's And so he was very right. sort of just chanting with his job, and he yeah. was always guys upstairs were always said, you gotta stand here because I'm gonna be in a meeting and if they ask me a question, I'm gonna have to ask you, you know, that kind of thing. 
But I, I know in a lot of those kind of institutions, there's kind of a rounding error of, well, we haven't had to deal with this for a long time, and then the knowledge kind of gets transferred this way to the next guy, right. minus that piece, and then there's another piece that starts to, to go away. And at some point, it becomes these sort of darker areas. Of you lose the unknown. institutional history. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I yeah. was wondering, especially with something so critical to the infrastructure of the city and also so mammoth and right. difficult to see, how that, what preserves that knowledge and how does that whole system? Well, I think p part, of, part of it is that luckily we haven't privatized too much in this city. I, I fear for places where, where whole systems have been, you know, like the, the, um, the parking meters in Chicago or a lot of the, you know, they're, they're privatizing the Nassau County bus system now. You know, what happens when that contract is up? How is the next person yeah. going to know how to do that? Or you know, what's going to be lost in that? I'm, I worry about that yeah. many nights. But you never felt, in, in your study of the water structure, for example, the city, you never felt there were neglected pieces that were, I mean, probably- Not really, no. I think maybe that. water's a little bit different. People get really obsessive about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> that's so. not good. Yeah. Good to hear. Good. But interviewing the people who do that might be a way of bringing more attention. Like you're saying, how do you focus more attention on what's there? Yeah. Those might be the people who would be the, become the voices of that that you might be able to use as a more public vehicle for that. Right, if they were allowed to speak. There's <laughs> <laughs> a question, man. Yeah. Um, these infrastructures, these uh, public works, are part of the cultural heritage, part of the history of the city. Yeah. Um, there are beautiful architectural objects as well, which might be considered uh, for uh, conservation, maybe. But on the other hand, one of the typical characteristics of infrastructure is that it's continuously being updated, mm -hmm. and reconsidered, and, and even reconceived. Uh, and I was wondering in which way, or what is the policy of the city or the state, even um, considering um, uh, the protection of infrastructure as heritage? Well, I think it's it's one of those issues where they might not do anything until they get pushed to do it, except if there's some economic development reason to do it. So, for example, um, there are a few parts of this the old water infrastructure that are now landmarks, so they're protected. The, the city says these are official landmarks and we're going to keep them where they are. These places, um, I think this one actually has been adopted by uh, a local group in Massapequa, and they take care of it. I think it may actually have a roof on it. This photograph was from the 90s, so it, it may look, I think it looks better now. But one of the things that I want to try to do with some of these places is get them listed on the National Register of Historic Places, because they're not. And that doesn't mean that they can't be torn down, but it, it makes it a little bit harder for someone to go ahead and just bulldoze it. So yeah, the more, the more, uh, knowledge there is of why a building is the way it is, the, the safer it is, I think. A similar question with the science experiments, because I feel like you people pay money to go and see, like, Galileo's, you know, whatever, or, yeah. you know, and <laughs> whatever you have. Um, <laughs> Telescopes. And, yeah. but, um, but, you know, um, these giant experiments that you mm -hmm. were seeing dismantled, Right. Recycling bins full yeah. of copper and whatnot. And is there any thought, at least, to preserve some of those? Would be important. I mean, they're so massive. It, 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 I can see how it'd be hard to imagine maintaining. Yeah, it would be, and especially since the the real estate in those spaces becomes so valuable. If you need to build a new experiment, I mean, the one, the Mark II, that's been sitting there for probably twenty years, and and it could sit another 20 years if they don't need to put something else in there. I mean, they, a lot of the labs do have some exhibits of some of the older, smaller devices, so they, they have a, a public, uh, you know, some public programs and people can come see them. But for the really big stuff, I'm not sure what they can do other than, you know, put a bubble chamber out in the parking lot. Yeah? I have a question about, like, so we've seen a lot of the, your Infrastructure, a lot of the telescopes and like how to provide and all these other things. Where do you where do you see like the person in your like, photographs be? Like, um, because we never really see people like we talk about them being their own little 
world. And right. Like, I'm not like advocating, oh, we should do, you should do like portraitures or like, right. shift gears, but like in your mind, where do you see like the person in all, all these photos? Um, to me, none of these things would be, would exist without people. So it's almost redundant for me to think about putting a person in the picture. For aesthetics reasons, I don't want the people in the picture usually because I, I tend to want you to struggle with the scale of things at first, um, and that would give it away. And I think that people often tend to take away from what I'm saying about the forms. Um, lots of other people photograph people, so I, and they probably do it better than I do, so I leave it to them. Let's just do two, two more questions. Great. Yeah. Um, I guess, like, just right up, just the biggest thing, like, why do you stick with black and white? I mean, I personally love black and white <laughs> photos, but I mean, it's just, it's funny because you're talking about, like, oh, this one's from the 50s, this one's from the 60s, now right. this one's certain, so there's a timelessness to all the photos that you maybe not, you don't know what time period's from. So I'm just wondering, like, is it aesthetic, is it compositional, is it shade and shadow, or is it that timelessness, which is why you stick with black and white? Um, there are a few reasons. I mean, the, the main reason is is back to the form again. I, especially since so, some of these are painted in such wild colors, <laughs> I don't want to distract from the forms. And the black and white is is just about that for me. Um, <clears throat> for practical reasons, when you shoot in in these places with odd artificial light and really dark places, film doesn't behave well. I mean. You didn't mention digital, so I won't even talk about that. Um, <laughs> well, that's kind of so I, I can admit that. <laughs> but film just it it shifts colors. It it does very strange things in artificial environments, and I didn't want to mess with that. Black and white, I still print in my own darkroom, and I can control what I get much better than I could with color. Um, I'm working on a couple projects now that are color because they seem to need it. So I don't. I'm not against color, it just wasn't the right project for it. Yeah. You still shoot for color? Um, yeah, I do. I'm shooting a little bit of digital, but I'm still shooting mostly film and mostly black and white, but some color now. Good. Um, reciprocity, even on the most expensive digital back, is still off. I mean, you get a $65,000 digital back, and throw it like a two million exposure on it, looks like a dog shit. That's, that's why I shoot with film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I might, I might hog, the, hog the final, final question, yeah, if yeah. you don't mind. Um, it seems that uh, one thing I, I always enjoy uh, speaking to you, or one of the reasons I always enjoy speaking to you is that you always have, um, you seem to know all these little nooks and corners of the, of the city. And um, there are two examples that I think are interesting that um, maybe if you could just recount briefly for everyone, but then I'm curious about other examples of these. But one was the, was the large tubes that you mentioned uh, here at Studio X last week that um, uh, when it, during the, the hydraulic or the, the pneumatic event, that um, the I can't even remember what they were used for, but they're they're disused um, tube infrastructure that could potentially be pneumatized. Oh, the high pressure fire service. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And then also there was a, something that I guess you emailed to Brian Finocchi, um maybe <laughs> four or five years ago that, that he and I that, uh -oh. that, that really kind of put a put a bee in our bonnet. That was um, something like there's a there's a tunnel that Northrop Grumman or somebody like that had that went out under. From a from one of the like a warehouse in Brooklyn, out under the river and went somewhere else, and it, it was it, if it wasn't Northrop Grumman, it was another one of the kind of uh, <laughs> private military companies that has some sort of tunnel. And it's still there apparently, but yet it's not being used. So my my point. I so think let, me, I know let, me, let, me, let me let me wrap these up really okay. briefly by saying that the question is really um, these as far as these kinds of undiscovered or potentially even non-existent, more like urban legend spaces. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm curious about what. Uh, other stories might be attractive to you and that you might try to photograph and, and along those lines, is there something out there that's like, not your holy grail, but the next thing that you're, right. you can't wait until they open that door on 82nd no. Street because you're going to be there. And so like, what, what's, what's out there right now that's been, that's, that's really kind of keeping you awake well, that you want to see? I'll tell you the holy grail of, of a lot of urban explorers, which I don't think exists, so I'm not that interested in it. And that's the original, um, Beach subway tunnel, the pneumatic subway tunnel, which was on Broadway near City Hall. 
there are a bunch of people that still think that it exists and someday they're going to find it. I don't think it does because when they built the art train, they, they must have destroyed it. So, so I'm not going to find that. What, what I would love to see is, you know, I didn't talk about why they were building the third water tunnel. Um, the other two tunnels are old enough that they probably need some maintenance, but they can't shut them down because we need the water that's in them and we need them to be operating all the time. When enough of the, the third tunnel is in operation, they can shut down parts of tunnel one or two and see what's going on in there. And I thought that it was going to happen fairly soon, and I was just talking to one of the engineers who told me that they put it off for maybe five or ten years. I'm kind of dying to go in one of those old tunnels when they empty it out, and even better, take a bicycle and bike the length of it. But I'm not sure that's ever going to happen. <laughs> that's what I think. The other tunnel that, that you were alluding to, it could be one of two things. I, I heard a couple stories about a tunnel that went from the Brooklyn Navy Yard to um, the building next to where my studio used to be in Dumbo, which was a munitions factory. Um, and actually, I also heard a rumor about a tunnel that went between Prospect Park and Greenwood Cemetery. I'm not sure how much I believe that. Yeah. I have done searching for bootleggers tunnels that I think were probably old private sewers. Um, someone told me about a bootleggers tunnel that went to uh, Breezy Point and she swore that it existed because her father was a bootlegger and that was where she lived. So I kind of believe that one. Um, and there are some tunnels that Con Ed uses that go under the rivers for, um, that have power cables in them and they are big enough to walk through. So I've seen pictures of those and that would be kind of cool. Those are, those are kind of the ones off the top of my head. Yeah. All right, well, thanks, Stanley. That was great. Thank you. And, um, so I would urge you all to check out uh, the books that are on the table there. Those are for sale. So um, yeah, by all means, uh, please uh, pick up a copy and, and, uh, and uh, support, support the artists. And um, check out Stanley's website as well. It's uh, stanleygreenberg.org. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really don't want to me. carry the books home, so. <laughs> so help them out. <laughs> On your own tour around the Southwest, which was one of the most interesting spots you guys got in. Yeah.